be doing, uh, we're not going to be doing, we're going to be reading Deuteronomy um, 6, which is, uh, love the Lord your God, and before we start, we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just dedicate this time and the season to you, Father. It's not, um, it's not easy for everybody, and there's a lot of pain and sorrow around Christmas time, and I think the enemy also likes to use this day um, to hurt people because it's cold and it's miserable and people die around this holiday. Um, people divorce and separate um, around Christmas um, and New Year's. And uh, God, there's so many, um, there's so much pain and sorrow. But the beauty of your birth, the fact that you came to, to be born and die at the same time is, is really it's really beautiful that you actually broke um, the power of sin and death. You broke the power that the enemy has over us. And so, Father, I pray you call to unity uh, this Christmas to bring families together and to heal and mend those wounds in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, to heal and mend the wounds of, of my beloved wife, Kaylin. To heal and mend the wounds of our families to seek to love and to give and uh, to no longer run from the Father, but run to Him. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. So we're going to do uh, Deuteronomy 6. So let me open it up here in the Bible. And here we go. Oh, one second. Let's make sure this is loaded. There we go. And we are good. My phone's going a little crazy because it's just connected to the internet. Come on, phone. Sorry, Mom. Hold tight. There we go. Chapter 6. A Call for Wholehearted Commitment. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve Him. When you take an oath, you must use only His name. You must not worship any of the gods of neighboring nations, for the Lord your God who lives among you is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa. You must diligently obey the commands of the Lord your God, all the laws and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors. You will drive out all the enemies living in the land, just as the Lord said you would. In the future, your children will ask you, What is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, 
We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give our ancestors. And the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives, as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands the Lord our God has given us. Really beautiful chapter, hey? And uh, what I love there is the love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind is actually in Deuteronomy 6. And so, you know, you have the wrap-up of the commands, and then Jesus would have been reading this, hey, right after. So I think that's really, um, really beautiful. So I'm going to read the, um, the commentary here. Um, and I'll put this down there. So, um, 6.3... Well, I can actually read the Ten Commandments here quickly. So, uh, broken commandments. The Ten Commandments were God's standard for right living to obey them, was to obey God. 5, 6, 21. Yet, throughout the Old Testament, we can see how each commandment was broken. As you read the stories, notice the tragic consequences that occur as a result of violating God's law. And then, the Ten Commandments, and we have notable violations. So, um, Ten Commandments. You must not have any other God but me. Solomon, 1 King 11. So that's a violation. Uh, you must n not make, an, uh, make for yourself an idol of any kind. You must not bow down to them or worship them. Violation, the golden calf incident. Uh, Exodus 32, generations after Joshua. Joshua 2, 10 to 14. 2 Kings 21, 1 to 5. And Jeremiah 1, 16. You must uh, not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Uh, Zedekiah um, and Ezekiel 17, 15, 21. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Judah, 2 Chronicles 36, 21. Um, honor your father and mother. Eli's son, Hophni and Phinephes and 1 Samuel 2, 12, 23, 25. You must not murder. Hazael, 2 Kings 8.15. You must not commit adultery. David, <laughs> yeah, we remember David, right? 2 Samuel 11, 2-5. You must not steal. Ahab, 1 Kings 21, 1-19. You must not testify falsely against your brother, Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 13-25. Do you remember Saul's story here? About um, testifying falsely against your neighbor? Is that when he sends him off to war? Or that's what David did, though, right? It was Saul? Yeah, it says Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 13 and 25. Well, no, I don't... Well, there was a problem between David and Saul, and Saul was his father-in-law, right? Yeah. Well, he wasn't his father-in-law. Um, his best friend's father was Saul. And he was the king, and he was jealous of David. That's, that's what I was thinking of. Is it Solomon or Saul? Saul. Oh. Okay. So maybe Saul is the do not testify falsely against your neighbor. I don't know. You must not covet your neighbor's wife. You must not covet your neighbor's house or land or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Uh, Achan. Yeah, the story of Achan. So many people suffered because of Achan. He kept, uh, he kept the plunder, hey, from... Uh, uh, is it, is it the promised land in Joshua when they defeat the Canaanites? And, uh, oh, it, it's like an attempt and their army loses. So many people die because Achan takes plunder that he's not supposed to. So it's leave before the Lord. I don't know if it's the same battle. I can't remember. But, uh, and then Achan and his family are put to death and, uh, then they go to battle and nobody steals the next time they all obey. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's a good lesson. 6 verse 3 For a nation that had wandered 40 years in a parched wilderness, a land flowing with milk and honey sound, uh, sunny sounded like paradise. 
It brought the it brought to mind rich crops, rushing streams, gentle rains, and lush fields filled with livestock. The Israelites could have had all that 40 years earlier. Numbers 13 to 14 explain how the people missed their chance. Now Moses was determined. Sorry, my phone. Um, Moses was determined to help the people avoid the same mistake by whetting their appetite for the beautiful land and then clearly explaining the conditions for entering the land. 6 verse 4, monotheism, belief in only one God, was a distinctive feature of Hebrew religion. Many ancient religions believed in many gods, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of the whole earth, the one and only true God. This was an important insight for the nation of Israel, because they were about to enter a land filled with people who believed in many gods, both them and today, both then and today. There are people who prefer to place their trust in many different values, belief systems, and gods, but the day is coming when God will recognize will be God will be recognized as, as the only one. He will be king over the whole earth. Zechariah fourteen verse nine. Uh, chapter 6, 4-9. to nine. This passage provides a central theme uh, of Deuteronomy. It sets a pattern that helps us relate uh, the Word of God to our daily lives. We are to love God, think constantly about His commandments, teach His commandments to our children, and live each day by the guidelines of His Word. God emphasizes the importance of parents teaching the Bible to their children. The church and Christian schools cannot be used as an escape for responsibility. We know this very well. The Bible provides so many opportunities for object lessons and practical teaching that it would be uh, a shame to study it only one day a week. Eternal truths are most effectively learned in the loving environment of a God-fearing home. 6 verse 5, Jesus said that our um, that loving God with all ourselves is the first and greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37-39. This command, combined with the uh, command to love your neighbor, Leviticus nineteen eighteen, emphasizes all the other, uh, all the other Old Testament laws. And I'll continue. I was just thinking about like, what if we uh, only educated our, our kids in the Bible? And I think if you were to only educate them in something, it feels like the Bible wouldn't be that bad if that was their only education. Six seven. It covers everything. Well, that's what I'm thinking. It covers your whole lifestyle, right? Um, and then you kind of go out into the world through that lens and through walking of holiness. So it might even even be better than going to a public school system. But at the same time, you don't get to learn about computers necessarily in there, or you know, any such things. But do you need those things? You know, according to the scripture, you don't. You don't need those things, right? You need eternity with the Heavenly Father. 6 verse 7. Uh, the Hebrews were extremely successful at making religion an integral part of their life. Of life, The reason for their success was that religious ed- education was life-oriented, not informed, uh, information-oriented. They used the context of daily life to teach about God. The key to teaching your children to love God is stated simply and clearly in these verses. If you want your children to follow God, you must make God a part of everyday experiences. You must teach your children diligently to see God in all aspects of life, not just those that are church-related. I think we can all uh, grow in that experience, to do more of that um, in each other's lives. Uh, 6, 10 to 13. Moses warned the people not to forget God um, when they entered the promised land and became prosperous. Prosperity, um, more than poverty, can dull our spiritual vision because it tends to make us self-sufficient and eager to acquire still more every, still more of everything except God. The same thing can happen in our church. Once we become successful in um, terms of numbers... Yeah, in terms of numbers, programs, and buildings, we can easily become self-sufficient and less sensitive to our need for God. This leads us to concentrate on self-preservation rather than thankfulness and service to God. Um, This happens a lot, too, with churches worrying about their finances and all kinds of things from day to day, as opposed to surrendering it to God, you know, and saying, God, it's you or bust. 
Could you imagine if we did that? God, it doesn't look like the money is going to be working out. But obviously, if you call this ministry to happen, you will cause a breakthrough. And I will be obedient. God, it's you or bust. You know, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Could you imagine that attitude? Yeah. Um, 624. Does the phrase, so he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives, mean that we can expect only good things and no suffering when we obey God? <laughs> no. What is promised here is a relationship with God. If anything, it gets tougher. For all those who love him with all their heart, it speaks of a good relationship with God and ultimate benefit of knowing him. It's not a blanket of protection against poverty, adversity, and suffering. So you get to have a relationship with God and most likely you will have poverty. Most likely you'll have adversity and most likely you'll have suffering. Uh... I think scripture says something about if you have not suffered for me, right? For the sake of Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, We can have this right relationship with God by obeying his command to love him with all that we are. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that we are called to love you with all that we are. Help us, God, to surrender everything of us to you. Help us to not lay down flat when we fail and when we sin. Help us to get back up and to realize that, God, you are our strength and we are not our own strength, God. We do not make everything happen. We participate in the victory of the great giver and the life provider and the the greatest principle and greatest spirit, Holy Spirit. Um, The power comes from you, God, by the name and by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, God, we pray that you just continue to walk with us, strengthen us, and encourage us. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And for all marriages, too, and during the season as well, God, continue to bless and take care of those. It's frightfully cold out there tonight, God. Keep many people warm, Jesus, and keep their hearts warm, too, to open their doors to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Type this word into Google. H A N N U K A H. Hanukkah. Yeah. The definition of Hanukkah or what? Yeah, just type in the word and see what comes up. Hey Google, what is Hanukkah? Here's a summary from Wikipedia. Hanukkah is a Jewish festival commemorating the rededication of the Second Temple in Jerusalem at the time of the Maccabean Revolt against the Seleucid Empire. It is also known as the Festival of Lights. So it's it's a rededication of the Second Temple um, in history. That's what Hanukkah is. It's, it's more than that. Um, type in Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Hey Google. Did Jesus celebrate Hanukkah? Sorry, I can't help with that yet, but I found something related. Do you want to know did Jesus celebrate the Feast of Dedication? Yes. Yes, please. According to wikipedia.org, the Feast of Dedication is also mentioned in John chapter 10 verse 22 where it mentions Jesus being at the Jerusalem temple during the Feast of Dedication and further notes and it was winter. The Greek term used in John is the renewals. So, Mom, uh, in John, Jesus attended what was called the Feast of Dedication. Um, so, not Hanukkah, something different. And it was, it was winter time when they had the Feast of Dedication. I can ask, I can ask for the definition of the Dedication Feast if you want. It is Hanukkah, the same feast. No, it's not. Hey, Google, is the Feast of Dedication and Hanukkah the same feast? According to Wikipedia, the Feast of Dedication, today Hanukkah, once also called Feast of the Maccabees, was a Jewish festival observed for eight days from the 25th of Kislev. To find out more, look for the link in your Google Home or Google Assistant app. Hey Google, what is the Feast of Dedication? Here's a summary from Wikipedia. Hanukkah is a Jewish festival commemorating the rededication of the Second Temple in Jerusalem oh, it is the same. time of the Maccabean Revolt against the Why Sons do I need to be Empire. so grumpy? It is also known as the know. Festival of Lights. Uh, Mom, I need to apologize to you. Feast of Dedication and Hanukkah are the same thing. Yeah, they are. Yeah.
And there's a prophecy about Hanukkah, uh, which relates to the second coming of Jesus. Maybe you could look up Hanukkah prophecy. Hey, Google. What is the Hanukkah prophecy? Sorry, I can't help with that yet. Hey, Google. Is there a prophecy of Hanukkah? Sorry, I can't help with that yet. Hey, Google. Hanukkah prophecy definition? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that yet. I wonder if uh, Google pro uh, doesn't provide information on prophecy. Doesn't like that word. Uh, probably not. Why don't you just type it in yourself in the search bar? Hundreds of prophecy. Why? Why don't you just tell me? What do you What do you want to tell me? Well, I'll send you the link then. There's some current prophecy. It's very exciting. And, uh, I heard it uh, from Rabbi um, Jonathan Kahn. Mm-hmm. And, and uh... I just want to encourage you because I know that right now Christmas is not of any interest to you. But actually, Hanukkah, the festival of light, which is all about Jesus and the oil of the Holy Spirit, is very exciting to study. Hmm. And I think it could really minister to your soul. Yeah, I would love to go to Jerusalem for Christmas. That sounds amazing. For Hanukkah. So I'll send you some of the good links. I have found, but even if you just looked up on the prophecy or Rabbi Jonathan Khan, you'd probably get a quick picture. Okay. Uh, then. Thanks, guys, for watching. Have a good day. God bless you.